Uh, welcome everyone to the HEI Weekly Research Seminar. Uh, my name is Miles Brundage. I lead policy research at OpenAI. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Ding. Jeff is a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation and Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI. He received his PhD in international relations from the University of Oxford, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. Jeff has also worked as a researcher for Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology and Oxford Center for the Governance of AI. In his talk today, Jeff will discuss how technological revolutions affect the rise and fall of great powers. Existing studies establish that a nation's success in adapting to revolutionary technologies is determined by the fit between its institutions and the demands of those technologies. Jeff will propose an alter alternative mechanism based on the diffusion of general purpose technologies, which presents a different trajectory for countries to leapfrog the industrial leader. Before we begin the presentation, a few logistical details. You can use the QR code on the screen to ask questions through Slido, or you can click on the link uh, that will be in the chat shortly. I'll be drawing questions from Slido after the presentation. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, feel free to share your screen and get started. Thanks, Miles. Let's see. If... Is that working for folks? Looks good. Great. Uh, really glad to have Miles here because I started researching AI governance issues basically under his tutelage at Oxford. Uh, so, and also for those interested in these topics, he's led projects on what I think are going to be foundational texts for AI governance, like malicious use and trustworthy AI report. So, really glad to have him be moderating and discussing this talk. I want to start with what has become a really prevalent meme in a discourse and discussion about US-China technological competition, uh, this idea of an AI arms race between the two countries. And one of the th things I've struggled with is what exactly are we racing over? Is it a specific autonomous weapon? Is it something about like more generalized AI? Is it, a, is it an economic competition? Is it a competition for prestige? And I think this picture, which is actually taken from an article about the AI arms race, uh, captures a lot of this confusion for me. Because if you've watched the Queen's Gambit, you know that this is not a natural board position for chess. Like It's just physically not possible for uh, the kings to be touching each other. Uh, and I think, and I hope that sort of this presentation will help us get a better sense of what the landscape or the chessboard, so to speak, of US-China technological competition actually is. And maybe one starting point can be this quote from Chinese President Xi Jinping. This was actually at a summit of BRICS nations, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, on the topic of the fourth industrial revolution. And in the speech, she calls back to past industrial revolutions, these periods of disruptive technological innovations and how they fundamentally changed the development trajectory of history. I think to get more specific, we can look at this interpretation of the speech from the Study Times, which is a journal that's published by the Central Party School. Uh, in China, which trains like the next generation of communist leaders, it, it provides a good signal of what leadership is thinking about different issues. And here they're interpreting that speech from that previous slide. And they make a more specific claim about how these new technolo these technological revolutions present the opportunity for countries to take world leading productivity advantages. And that corresponds with literature and international relations, which is my field, about how economic productivity is a key driving force of latent power and, and a country's rise to great power status. This is reflected in a classic text by historian Paul Kennedy about the rise and fall of great powers, uh, which inspires um, this talk and the dissertation on which the talk is based. And he, there he outlines an important causal chain for the rise and fall of great powers involving differentials in growth rates and technological change leading to shifts in the global economic balances. And then later those gradually 
affect political and military balances. And that's an important aspect to talk about for the purposes of limiting, limiting my discussion today. I'm only going to be talking about that first aspect of the chain. How do these new emerging technologies affect shifts in the global economic balances, specifically economic differentials, economic growth differentials among great powers? And the standard account, at least in the political science and international relations scholarship, is very much based around leading sectors. One country dominates, monopolizes these new technological advances that spur fast growing large industries. They derive monopoly profits. Uh, they export these products and eventually rise to become the world's most productive economy. And we see that reflected in summaries of the literature on technological change and international relations, where the idea is that historically a great power acquires hegemony through a near monopoly on innovation in leading sectors. And this very much is borrowing from the work of economists like Walt Rostow, where he outlines this classic sequence of great leading sectors. And we see prominent industries connected to major technological breakthroughs in the past, like Hargreaves Spinning Jenny, the cotton textiles industry, in the first industrial revolution, the steel industry, chemical industry, which we'll talk about later in terms of Germany's rise in the end of the 19th century, automobile industry as well. All of these industries at the, uh, were incubated off the back of major technological breakthroughs, grew fast and became very, very large industries. Today, just to preview my argument, I'm gonna be talking about a different model of how technologies interact with a country's domestic institutions to allow one great power to sustain productivity rates, productivity growth rates at higher levels than their rivals. And the key concept here for me is general purpose technologies, wherein it's not necessarily about monopolizing all of innovation in these general purpose technologies because they're so fundamental and, and foundational that they span all these different industries. And one way to think about it is like in AI today, um, no one country is gonna dominate all of innovation in AI as a broad field. And potentially the, the real impact of AI is not gonna come through one industry, but through, through a spread across the entire economy. And if we have this different trajectory in mind, that informs what the most important institutional factors are. And I'll highlight in my argument, specifically this concept of GPT skill infrastructure or systems that widen the base of engineering skills and, and also standardize the, the engineering discipline associated with a new GPT. So I'm gonna dive deeper into the differences between my argument and the leading sector count in the next section. Then going to look specifically at the second industrial revolution as a template for testing these two uh, mechanisms of how technological change affects the rise and fall of great powers. I'm not going to have time to look at the other two cases, but I'll give you just a bridge summaries of them. And then we're going to also spend some time uh, talking about the implications for AI and US-China competition, bringing it back to that chessboard in the first slide. So one key premise for both models, both the leading sector model and the GPT model, is that new technologies create demands and the country that adapts to those demands best by adjusting their institutions uh, is able to take technological leadership. So the key is whether a country can adapt its institutions, its education system, its political institutions, its system of intellectual property protection, uh, sometimes specific industrial policies, how it can adapt these types of institutions um, to fit the missing puzzle piece, which is the demands created by these new technologies. The standard leading sector account says that that fit has to be based on the most dramatic aspects of technological change, which is the initial eureka moment, who is the first to develop a new innovation. Um, 
And then the most important institutional adjustments, if you care most about innovation leading sectors is are things like potentially protecting big firms who are at the frontier, who are at the technological frontier. Um, it might be about training the most elite talent in this um, in the sphere. And one way to think about what the leading sector model is, is taking inspiration from is this idea of the product cycle. And this is a concept pioneered by Raymond Vernon, uh, taking the model of a multinational corporation and how a multinational corporation takes advantage of new product innovations. You now, what, what I want you to focus on here is the blue line of the innovating firm. They do groundbreaking R&D on this new product innovation. They have this brief period of time where they get to monopolize sales and profits. Over time, they start selling it to other countries, other firms. You see the rise of other competitors. And then over time, the innovating firm loses their monopoly and doesn't derive any more benefits as the production of that innovation spreads to other competitors or other countries. And you see how some of these assumptions and ideas resonate in how existing scholarship uh, and the leading sector template thinks of emerging technologies and power balances, where you have these new innovations clustering in one country, one firm is, is the creator of a product innovation. The greatest marginal stimulation to growth comes early on when the leading sector is expanding rapidly. So you have that brief window of monopoly profits. And the focus is not on diffusion. Actually, it's when diffusion and imitation transform these new innovations into routine and widespread components of the world economy. That process for them is when the leading sector mechanism ends. That's when that, that brief window has closed. And it's, it's more about that uh, initial stimulation to growth and early diffusion of these major technologies. So I think my alternative explanation is trying to expand beyond that product cycle model. What happens if it's not a product innovation in one industry? What happens if the new technological changes that are happening in these revolutions are ones that are more like general purpose technologies, uh, like electricity, like the computer, like potentially AI today. And economists and economic historians have identified these GPTs as historical engines of productivity growth, defined by three, per, uh, by three characteristics. The first is that there's this great scope for continual improvement. So oftentimes with a new GPT, a uh, research paradigm that surrounds that GPT. Second is the potential for pervasiveness and the ability to seep into all different sectors of the economy, right? Something like an innovation in automobiles is not going to affect every single sector of the economy um, or some, something like an innovation in cotton textiles is not gonna do the same either. And finally, strong technological synergies. GPTs need complementary innovations and also inspire these complementary innovations across all these different sectors. And the quote from Paul David at the end of this slide, I think captures how different this trajectory is from the product cycle. We have an extended trajectory of incremental technical improvements. We have a gradual and protracted process of diffusion. Actually, it's that process of diffusion into widespread use that, that is the emphasis of, of GPT diffusion theory. Um, and the idea here is it might be especially relevant for great powers to care about diffusion and this extended trajectory of GPTs. Uh, because at least among these countries, you're gonna have firms at the innovative frontier, right? China has, uh, in the case of today in AI, China has leading AI firms. It's, they're, they're also contributing to the frontier of AI research. Um, but it, it might be that divergences in the AI trajectory are gonna be more about this divergence in diffusion and widespread imitation of advances across the entire economy. And I'm not saying, I, I wanna be very clear that of course, being the first to introduce new technologies is gonna have 
a positive effect on widespread adoption, right? You, there's, there's a lot of uh, tacit knowledge in some of these new technologies that for it to spread, you might have to have a certain innovative capacity, but it's definitely not determinative. Determinative, And there's all these other different factors that could uh, affect the diffusion of these technologies across uh, internally across the economy, including systems of standardization, human capital, which I'll be talking about uh, specifically, and communication networks, um, all these different factors that could outweigh uh, the advantage of being the first innovator. So if we have this GPT diffusion trajectory in mind, we have a different sort of missing puzzle piece space and that, that shapes which institutions most suit the demands of these new technologies. And specifically, I highlight uh, GPT skill infrastructure in the sense of widening and standardizing uh, the pool of engineering skills and talent linked to a new GPT. And I think this solves, uh, this addresses two common problems we see with uh, GPT development. First is one that is pretty consistent across all new technologies, which is a great deal of human capital upgrading uh, in terms of skills having to catch up to new technologies. But the second for GPTs is also important in terms of there needs to be a lot of coordination between the GPT sector and, and numerous application sectors. And this is drawing a lot from uh, Trat Trattenberg's work uh, on this issue. He's one of the economists that first started talking about GPTs. And one of the arguments that he makes is um, the application sector needs to know what's happening in the GPT sector in terms of new advances. And likewise, the other direction as well. Um, and to be able to coordinate those information flows, it might be helpful to have uh, the strong engineering discipline and, and the standardized set of best practices associated with the GPT. So that's why often historically we'll see with a new GPT, you'll see a new distinct engineering specialty. So electrical engineering in the wake of electricity uh, computer science is very much an engineering oriented discipline that arose in the wake of the computer. So these are the type of institutions that I highlight based off of the different trajectory uh, posed by GPT diffusion theory. In some, what we have here in terms of the argument that I'm making is you have the same cause, a technological revolution, you have the same outcome, an economic power transition in which one great power sustains productivity growth at higher rates than its rivals, but you have two very different pathways. In terms of leading sector product cycles, I wanna highlight three different dimensions. The first is impact timeframe. You have as focused on the early stages, whereas GPT diffusion is more lopsided in later stages. In terms of the phase of technological change that we care about the most, uh, leading sector product cycles, as I've talked about, emphasizes the innovation aspect, the, the first initial introduction, the first implementation of a new technology. GPT diffusion focuses on um, the intensive penetration of a technology throughout the entire economy. Breadth of growth concentrated in one or two new leading sectors versus dispersed across the entire economy. And we see also how that maps onto different types of institutional complementarities. I I, in this table, I just highlight um, in terms of like talent uh, adjustments and whether you care about deepening the base of experts and top end talent in a, new in, in a new industry versus widening the skill base associated with adopting GPTs at scale. So I want to I want to tease out the differences between these two mechanisms uh, in the second industrial revolution case. And I'll say a few words about just why I choose these these cases. The first is when you're testing mechanisms, you want to choose cases where the cause and the outcome are both present. So in the second industrial revolution case, we have a we have a, a period of significant technological advances such as electric dynamo, indigo dye and synthetic dye stuffs as a key part of the chemical industry at this time. 
the internal combustion engine and the initial stage of the automobile industry. And one that I'll highlight specifically, which is the universal milling machine used to shape metals in a more precise way as a key development in what became known as the American system of manufacture, uh, in which it was a system of manufacturing that allowed for standardized parts um, and as, as a key, as another key technological innovation. And on the outcome side, you have what you have a shift from essentially a unipolar economic system to a multipolar economic system where Germany and the US um, overtake Britain in terms of economic leadership. I also focus on this case because the leading sector uh, accounts and existing scholarship calls back to the second industrial revolution. You have these new industries like the electrical industry, like the chemical industry uh, that are emerging at the time. It should favor uh, the leading sector account. And also it's a key reference point for present day discussions. And that's reflected in terms of just the phrase AI is the new electricity. If you Google that exact phrase right now, it'll turn up 20,000, 30,000 hits in Google. And to look at this case, I'm going to be examining, I think one of the key um, sources that I leverage is since the publication of sort of these field defining accounts about technological revolutions and power transitions, we've had new studies that revise dominant narratives of past technological revolutions, especially those that tended to conflate a technology's significance with near instantaneous diffusion, uh, which we'll see just was not the case. The last point in the background I wanna to touch on is that, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of literature that's focused on this this importance of economic efficiency, not just economic size, right? At this period of time, or at least if, if actually in the first industrial revolution case, China was the largest economy, uh, but no one thought of China as the economic leader because Britain was so much more uh, efficient in, um, in terms of productivity. Um, so here, if you actually look at different measures of GDP per capita, industrialization rates per capita, labor productivity, total factor productivity, it's the US that overtakes uh, Britain in this period. And that's why I'm gonna focus on what happened in the US in terms of these new technologies. So let's just run through each of the three dimensions that I highlighted and then what that means for thinking about the institutional complementarities. In terms of impact timeframes, um, we have support for the GPT diffusion story in terms of delayed timelines. Uh, especially in the U.S. case, because if someone wants to make the argument that the new chemical industry drove the U.S.'s economic rise, it's very hard to make that case um, for this period, because before World War I, only, there were only seven American dye makers. Uh, and it is easier to make the case for Germany for chemicals, but even though Germany dominated dye stuff production by 1913, uh, the some historians have argued the key impact of chemicals came not through dye stuffs, um, which was largely disconnected from this larger chemical engineering trajectory. And that really took off in the interwar period. We also see the similar timeline with electrification. There's a lot of empirical studies uh, that have found electrification's impact on US economic productivity became significant only after 1914, about four or five decades after the invention of the first uh, electric dynamo practical for industrial use. And we see that through qualitative accounts about the gradual transition to electric unit drive, where in the past factories were driven by this central steam engine. And then there was a gradual transition to group drive where you had groups of machines powered by electric dynamos uh, and then uh, electric generators. And then finally you had unit drive where you could power individual machines via electricity. And I don't have time to go through the specific timelines for internal combustion engine and automobile industry, but it, it generally followed this trend of impact, sort of a, only a small impact late in this period that we're talking about and mostly delayed effects. What's different is for GPT diffusion, we would expect sort of some of these earlier innovations in machine tools, as I mentioned with the universal milling machine or, um, at the top of this case, uh, 
Um, because these were incubated earlier than some of these other candidate GPTs like chemical engineering, electricity, uh, we'd expect widespread diffusion of these types of technologies in the heart of the period when the US actually rose to become an, an economic great power. Uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, we saw the proliferation of these new machine tools begin to reach torrential proportions. And the other key timing is, I'll investigate further for, for the leading sector count, is the steel industry does become a major industry before 1914, both US and German steel output far outpaced Britain in this respect. So we're gonna come back to that a little bit later. On the second dimension, it's not about in an exclusive innovation advantage. US firms introduce less than a third of these major breakthroughs in leading sectors. Um, and as you'll see from that quote from the British Institute of Electrical Engineers, Britain is not behind in terms of inventive genius in electrical science. It does lag behind, however, in terms of this practical application across the entire nation. And specifically on steel, I think sort of this, this idea that Germany completely dominated the steel industry uh, is a little bit misleading in the sense that technological breakthroughs in the steel industry kind of created two separate tracks. One was this more mass produced cheap steel. The other was this more high quality uh, steel that Britain maintained a comparative advantage in. So you had a lot of um, sort of raw counts of steel output that were reflecting cases where cheap German steel was sent to Britain and uh, processed into higher quality steel and exported for higher profit margins. And what we see as sort of the, the main source of American industrial advantage in this period is actually in terms of the diffusion and intensive penetration of machine tools in the system of interchangeable manufacture, where you have more than double the rate of machine intensity um, by 1907 in the US compared to its rivals. Their rivals were still producing kind of very sophisticated machine tools, especially in terms of power technology. There wasn't much of a difference in terms of an innovation advantage. Rather, the key difference, as we saw from reports of study teams from Britain that went to the US and visited all these different industries was this difference in terms of the adaptation of special apparatus across all branches of industry. Um, this difference in terms of the penetration of interchangeable manufacture across the economy. And finally, on the breadth of growth, the US did experience broad-based productivity growth um, over, I think, 33 of 38 sectors uh, were experiencing above 1% productivity growth um, in that last decade before World War I that we're focusing on. And also machine tools were this transmission center that spurred advances across to all the economies, machine using industries. So on all these dimensions, we see um, some support maybe for the leading sector in some areas, but the balance of evidence does seem to point towards GPT diffusion as the, as the better uh, mechanism. And if that's the case, we should, uh, that shifts the answer of how, like which institutions were, were the most important for adapting to the demands of the second industrial revolution. And specifically it's about who is able to broaden and widen the, um, to, to widen and standardize as the systems of um, human capital uh, in mechanical engineering specifically. And the US did that, whereas Britain lagged behind in terms of producing enough mechanical engineers based on different measures of engineering density. And actually Germany did produce a good number of mechanical engineers, but the, the sort of the information flows point that I was making earlier, the standardization of those information flows between these engineers was not was not established. And whereas the US had developed some of these standards in mechanical engineering, in Germany's case, that movement towards standardization um, was not inaugurated in, uh, until after World War I in that interwar period. And I think we can also see this example in chemicals as well, um, where uh, 
are you, the question is, are you focused on who dominated the synthetic dye industry or who had leadership in chemical engineering? Uh, and you on the left side, we'll see the synthetic dye story. And on, on the right side, we'll see the story for chemical engineering, which was uh, incubated very much in US institutions like MIT. So at, the, at this time, German universities dominated in terms of producing this world leading chemical uh, research. And actually the US was very much behind in terms of scientific leadership in this area and producing these fundamental innovations. However, that occupation, that unique occupation of chemical engineering failed to materialize in Germany. Whereas for the US case, even though it was very far from the frontier, it was leading in terms of introducing this new discipline of chemical engineering into universities. So I'll touch briefly on the other two cases. This is throwing a lot of information at you, but I just, the main purpose of this is just to show that I'm taking the same procedures, looking at these three dimensions of impact timeframe, phase of relative advantage, breadth of growth, and applying it to the first industrial revolution case. Uh, and here I highlight sort of the, the GPT trajectory of iron working advances versus the leading sector trajectory of cotton textiles. And also looking at GPT skill infrastructure in, in the first industrial revolution where it's, it's more about potentially the tweakers and the implementers who are enabling some of these iron working advances to spread across different industries. In the US Japan case in the third industrial revolution, which some people refer to as these new advances in computer technologies, it's a little bit different in the sense that there is no economic power transition. So the outcome doesn't occur. And so the empirical task in this case is to see if the mechanisms are present. If you see the mechanism present, that's actually evidence against the leading sector theory because the outcome, the predicted outcome that they would expect doesn't actually occur. And I think we see that most clearly, clearly in this quote by Maury and Rosenberg, where they make that, this is my favorite quote in the entire presentation because they're making that parallel between two German domination of dye stuffs um, and, and comparing it to the similarities in Japanese dominance in consumer electronics. But that doesn't translate into Japan overtaking the US as the number one economic power, Japan's productivity growth stalls in what's often called the last decade. And the GPT mechanism is absent because Japan does not lead the US in terms of the diffusion of general purpose information and communications technologies. So, so brief kind of overview of some of the evidence from these past uh, industrial revolutions. Now I want to turn to sort of drawing out some preliminary ideas for how this could revise our understandings of um, the, the landscape of US-China technological competition. And I'm going to be looking specifically at AI, which some have called the, the most important general purpose technology of our era. And there's been some evidence for an emerging GPT trajectory in AI mapped based on preprint paper data, uh, patent data, uh, patent data, and job postings data. Actually, that job postings data article I got from uh, Sarah's earlier HAI weekly seminar, uh, which you all should watch on YouTube, where she cited this Goldfarb um, paper about job postings reflecting this GPT trajectory. And I think across all these papers, they're trying to map on to different characteristics of GPTs. So in the case of patents, Petralia is uh, looking at whether there's great scope of continuous improvement in AI patents. He's looking at the pervasiveness of different patents, whether uh, the co-citation patterns connected to one type of patent is very broad and across the different technological classes, and also looking at the technological complementarity. So not only should the co-citations be broad, but if you're co-citing a GPT technology class, um, that should improve the productivity in that, um, that citing technological class as well. And across these indicators, you're able to potentially rank the GPT-ness of different technologies. <clears throat> 
And we see this anecdotally and sort of conceptually through this idea of AI as the new electricity um, industries that were formerly electrified, sorry, excuse me, electrified could potentially be cognitized or intelligentized. I do want to say one cautionary note in terms of these are sort of, these are predictions of what will be the next, the most important GPT. Um, it's hard to make these sort of predictions. I was think, I was just reflecting that if I were writing this dissertation back in 2000, I might've picked nanotechnology as the most important GPT of the era. The US had just implemented one of the most ambitious industrial policies in the National Nanotechnology Initiative. And you have quotes from people. This is actually an undersecretary of commerce. So this isn't just like some futurist. This is like someone very much in like leadership positions, US government responsible for technology policy, talking about nanotechnology's potential back then. And now today, we don't really talk about it at all. Who's to say that nanotechnology couldn't eventually become uh, the GPT if we talk about these extended diffusion timelines? We still have a lot of advances to go in terms of electrification and efficiency in electrification, electric batteries. So there's all these other candidate GPTs. I'm just taking AI as sort of like an exercise to run through how uh, my theory could apply to today's case. So I wanna run through the different dimensions quickly and then we can get to as much uh, conversation and, and debate as possible. So I think, most contemporary conversations about US-China competition AI are very much in this leading sector frame. Uh, we see this in the impact timeframe dimension, National Security Commission on AI's final report. I actually was an external consultant on this report. So I'm not like critiquing something that like, I think it was a really good product, but I think all good products have assumptions that might be flawed. And we see that the time frame is about China overtaking the US in AI leadership within a decade. Um, Harvard Belfer Center, Graham Allison, Eric Schmidt came up with a report in 2020 about US China competition AI, Kai Fu Lee's book on AI superpowers, which has been pretty influential in this space. Main impacts of AI will take place in the 2020s. And I think if you take the GPT diffusion model, and you're taking this new deep learning paradigm started in the early 2010s as sort of this, this key breakthrough in AI, um, then we shouldn't expect the productivity payoffs within the next decade. In fact, sort of we should expect four to five decades in terms of this delayed and prolonged gestation period. Now, I want to make one caveat that some people have argued this time could be different, and I fully think that's an important debate to be had. Um, Nicholas Kraft, economic historian who has studied past industrial revolutions, says the waiting time for GPTs to make their impact ha has declined over time. So um, we should we should take into account that potentially some of these insights might not translate perfectly in terms of impact time frame. At the same time, I think there's a lot of indicators that show this could be a really slow slow process in terms of. Um, applying some of these uh, new advances. And I'm interested to hear uh, Miles's thoughts as well in terms of like uh, open AI's major breakthroughs and how different um, companies are taking advantage of things like GPT-3 and foundational technologies. In terms of phase of advantage, I wanna draw again from that Belfer Center report, Allison Schmidt. Um, I'm not sort of, I don't have anything against this particular report. I think it's just reflective of sort of the mainstream discourse uh, where you see the indicators are very much about innovation leadership, top startups, top brands in sort of one industry, the biggest, most valuable internet companies uh, sort of arguing that China is close to becoming, it is a near peer competitor close to overtaking the US. GPT diffusion model, you might look at indicators in terms of how information communications technologies are penetrating across the entire industry. And China, China trails on a lot of these key technologies, cloud computing adoption, industrial software, um, and, and industrial robots in terms of like density and diffusion. Uh, and that sort of paints a different picture. And in terms of breadth of growth, we see this with sort of struggles with Chinese policy as well, where the focus is often on enhancing self-sufficiency and sort of these key strategic industries Whereas even 
Chinese cabinet level body state council has co-authored reports that say, hey, maybe we should shift toward these more horizontal um, industrial policies that are about supporting economy-wide innovation and efforts. And lastly, I'll touch a little bit on some of the initial measures for GPT skill infrastructure in AI, where the US still leads in terms of overall um, AI engineers uh, based on, I believe it's the 2017 uh, Tencent report, a white paper on AI talent. And especially on sort of these linkages, these attempts to like standardize information flows uh, in AI ac across this engineering discipline, uh, U.S. has higher levels of industry academic linkages and potential U.S.'s approach to standard setting in this space could be better positioned to uh, adopt these technologies at scale. So uh, to conclude, I've outlined sort of hopefully a better understanding of how and when emerging technologies can affect economic power transitions. We've kind of mapped that on into sort of revising how AI and other revolutionary technologies could affect the US-China power balance. My argument is actually the US is best positioned and very well positioned to succeed in this new industrial revolution. And more broadly, I hope this is a model for unpacking the causal effects of technological change on international politics where we look at where we sort of take seriously this proposition that not all technologies are created equal and look at how like specific features of technologies interact with um, institutions. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time and looking forward to uh, the discussion to follow. Awesome. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, please add your questions to Slido. There are a bunch already. Uh, and as I make the transition over to that platform, um, I'll ask one quick question, Jeff. Um, could you say a bit more about uh, sort of identifying GPTs uh, in the moment as opposed to retroactively? And, you know, would, would the, you mentioned a few indicators like patents and, and citations and so forth. Would those have actually worked uh, if we had tried to apply them in the past? And, you know, or would they have triggered a lot of false positives? Yeah, it's a it's a really great question. I think uh, other economic historians like Alexander Field have pointed out these similar issues with GPT selection identification. Um, they've like compiled really, really long lists of all these different technologies people have identified as GPTs and asked like, is the concept becoming meaningless if it includes everything? Um, I think, you know, part of this is just it's not like there's a hard distinction between like a GPT and an enabling technology. It's about sort of trying to get at different measures of GPT-ness and whether like as a technology is developing, can you try, can you try to make some predictions? And I think some of the articles I was citing that created these patent-based indicators or citation-based indicators, uh, you can get a sense of, uh, GPT-ness uh, of different technological classes. Um, so I think that would be the starting point. I think there has been some work in terms of looking back and just tracking individual technologies in the past, like electricity, sort of confirming that it does follow this GPT trajectory. But you're right to point out that that sort of work has not been done for like all potential technologies in, um, in this particular period in the past. Um, that has been done for like periods like 2000, 2010, um, where you have a lot more data. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a lingering issue. Some of it is um, for some of the ways in which I identify GPTs to potentially test. Um, some of that I rely just on people who have tried to identify major technology in the past and sort of work of historians and sort of using that as a starting point uh, in the absence of better measures of GPT-ness. Thanks. Um, and yeah, I, I tend to think that uh, AI is a <clears throat> good candidate for GPT, but I also want to be mindful of bias given that I, I work on it. Um, so, uh, so one question that we have um, through the chat, uh, uh, does your analysis also look through the lens of Carlota Perez's work on technological revolutions? This is a question from Detendra. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, Definitely very much drawing from uh, work, evolutionary economists, Perez, Sot, um, all the people who have looked at like, use terms like technological paradigms, or I believe like Perez's uh, 
um, also talking about like these pervasive technologies and uh, these like motive branches that spur widespread technological change. I think a lot of these are circling around sort of this, the same concept, which is that technologies differ in terms of their enabling potential and like in terms of their GPT-ness. So yeah, I think I just use the concept of a GPT just because, just because I think it could connect more to different literature strands. And I think it's, it's very relevant. Um, it's really relevant in the conversation today, but yeah, could have used terms and concepts um, from Perez's work and other people's work in this area as well. I think the same idea is there. It's not a novel idea that I'm creating out of thin air. Cool. Uh, another question uh, from Lav. Uh, do you view information technologies, uh, informational technologies differently from physical technologies since they are basically public goods in the sense of having essentially zero marginal cost? Um, and I would just add my own twist on the question, which is that in the case of AI, there are kind of a few different inputs that might have different properties in that sense, like data, it, you know, has, has low or no marginal cost for copying, whereas computing power is, is a different story. So how do you think about AI in, in, in those sorts of terms and general purpose technologies more broadly? Yeah, I think if I'm interpreting the question, maybe one argument that could come out of that question is like information technologies because they're different for this like marginal costs uh, difference that you've identified they might spread more quickly or you know they might differ from these previous gpts sort of like this added technological feature of of information technologies might confound application of the model um and, and i've heard and people have brought that up for me before i think Part of my answer would go to what actually Miles just pointed out is information technologies also have their own costs in terms of adoption um, with the potentially the need for like access to computing, whether it's the need for like widespread diffusion of cloud computing for um, sort of this uh, diffusion of information technologies. Uh, so, so they might present a lot of their their own costs. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's a it's an argument to test, right? Whether um, these information technologies would take longer to spread. I think one thing we can look at is computers. And actually at that time, people were saying there was this productivity paradox where um, you saw, like everybody was saying computers would be the next groundbreaking uh, innovation, but it took a really, really long time for computers to actually make their impact and followed actually largely the same timeline we would expect of GPT. So that might be one case where um, you do see some consistencies across different GPTs, even though there is a difference in, uh, there are some differences unique to information technologies. Awesome. And uh, just one logistical note, uh, please, if people are able to, if you have questions, uh, put them in Slido rather than uh, the chat, just so I can look at a single, single source of questions. And I'm also noticing that there's a lot of them coming in. So we're not going to be able to get to everything, but try to get through as many as possible. Uh, one question from David, uh, how do you think globalization and intellectual property theft are affecting the technology race today? Uh, and is globalization reducing earlier in a, early innovator advantages? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so one thing I'll say is that, uh, yeah, yeah, I think there is something about different about globalization today. Um, I don't think we should undersell the level of globalization that was happening in some of these previous periods. Um, some people argue we were more globalized in terms of the scientific community uh, in the second industrial revolution. Um, so there was a strong degree of globalization and sort of strong degree of knowledge flows within those past periods as well. Uh, I do think there, there is a good case to be made that globalization is qualitatively and quantitatively different today. And I think that probably does actually strengthen the GPT diffusion. Um, mechanism and it only makes it more salient. Uh, we've had studies from like the OECD that say uh, the gap, the initial adoption gap is closing. So when a frontier firm comes up with a major new innovation, the time it takes for maybe like a frontier firm in another country to adopt that innovation is, is shrinking. But sort of the gap between 
a frontier firm in a country adopting innovation and that innovation intensively penetrating across the entire economy is actually increasing. Um, so yeah, I, I think maybe uh, I, would, I would sort of agree with, with the assumption that you're putting forward. It's that maybe globalization is only making sort of this, this diffusion and intensive adoption uh, mechanism I'm highlighting more significant. Uh, great. So I'm going to kind of merge a few questions again, because we, we have a lot of them. So merging uh, questions from Tim and Luke, which both have to do with existing literatures and how your work relates to them. Um, could you comment on how your work relates to uh, innovator dilemma theory from Christensen, as well as uh, work by um, Chandler, I think Alfred Chandler is the, the reference, um, uh, and or the national systems of innovation literatures? Yeah, um, a lot of different literatures. Uh, and I think that's what's exciting about studying um, emerging technologies is you have to bring in all these different interdisciplinary literatures. Uh, if I'm interpreting the Christensen literature correctly and the innovator's dilemma, it's about disruptive innovations and how it's hard for established leaders to come up with these disruptive innovations. And I think that very much permeates uh, literature on leading sectors, which is like, uh, inevitably, we have these cycles of the rise and fall of great technologies and great powers because the existing leader has too many vested interests and they're not able to respond to these disruptive innovations. Uh, I think it's hard to, I think that faces the same problems in terms of applying it to the country level context uh, where the country is not a firm. Um, and we've also seen We've seen a lot of cases where actually the established leader is able to adapt, um, right? The U.S. sustained its lead in the third industrial uh, revolution. And we've also seen cases where the disruptor doesn't necessarily always succeed. So like there's differences in terms of the disruptor and, and, and the extent of success. So I think to get at these more nuanced um, distinctions, you have to get a little bit more specific and not just look at the level of disruptiveness of a technology, but look at um, GPTs and the, inst and the institutions that are necessary for adapting to GPTs. Um, Chandler scale and scope. Yeah, I think Chandler makes a really good argument as to why uh, the U.S. was better positioned to succeed in mass production type industries in the second industrial revolution. His argument largely relies on different models of capitalism, right? Specifically managerial capitalism, and the U.S.'s approach to supporting big businesses. Uh, I think, I think uh, again, sort of where, where my argument might differ a little bit is it's, it's not necessarily about succeed, like having the biggest electrical equipment industry or being able to create these big businesses and maintain oligopolies. Um, a lot of what was happening in sort of the American advantage at this time was spurred by small and medium enterprises, medium-sized businesses, networks among these different small and medium enterprises, especially in machine tools. And sort of the literature that I draw from is Scranton's work that sort of like kind of adds a little bit more diversity to, to what is what Chandler is talking about in this period. So those would be the literatures I'm engaging with there. Systems of national innovation, this is like um, Richard Nelson's work. Um, I'm, I can tell we have a very, like a wide ranging, good, diverse audience here today. So national innovation systems, um, you know, I think I'm very much in line with like their overall concept, which is just that you have to take the whole sort of like ecosystem of innovation into account. Um, a lot of what their arguments are about are targeted towards specific industries, right? So a lot of the national innovation um, systems work sort of is about how all these different this, these webs of uh, institutions involved in innovations support success in one industry um specific i'm just taking like a i'm arguing that there is a specific part of the innovation system about gpt skill infrastructure um and it mapping not on one specific industry but mapping on to these broad processes of gpt diffusion so i i, I see sort of that work as pretty complementary. Um, so there are a couple different questions about China and I'll, I'll just kind of cluster a few of them. 
Could you comment on how uh, different types of government uh, influence GPT diffusion, so authoritarian, democratic, et cetera, as well as um, whether there are any sort of distinctive uh, features of China that might uh, undercut your argument earlier that the US is well positioned, such as the number of engineers that are being uh, trained in China? Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, this is a weakness in my argument right now is I don't take into account uh, differences in regime type for the US and China case, um, because I'm looking at these past cases where you largely have sort of advanced industrial democracies. So I think, yeah, I think I'm very open to um, arguments that potentially authoritarianism might slow the rates of GPT diffusion, might increase the rates of GPT diffusion. Uh, I think those are important to make. Uh, sort of the, the, at least in terms of my argument, it's very much focused on institutions for skill formation, uh, institutions of standardization. Um, and in, in those cases, uh, I think there is some evidence that a more authoritarian top-down approach to uh, standardization might limit the widespread diffusion of technologies because you essentially lock in technologies that um, you lock in technologies too early on when there's still a lot of uncertainty about the technological trajectory. So that's one case where maybe the authoritarian political institution feeds into uh, sort of China not being able to take advantage of GPT diffusion. Uh, others could argue that sort of like China's approach to manage the economy might be different from their approach to managing politics. So maybe that channel is undercut, but yeah, a lot to explore there. Distinctive features of China, kind of going on to that question specifically, uh, number of engineers. I think you saw like, you actually saw some What's interesting is you saw similar arguments in the US-Japan case, when it was sort of like Japan was completely outpacing the US in terms of overall engineers. And I think there needs to be, and I, I need to do more work on this as well in terms of researching what's out there. I'm only relying on a few AI talent reports, but we need to have better granular measures of what constitutes an AI engineer or, or the type of like tweaker and implementer that's able to adopt sort of um, sort of some of these foundational AI advances across all these different industries. And what happened in the US-Japan case, at least, was actually, I think, in a State of the Union speech, Reagan was like, yeah, US, Japan is producing like two to three times more engineers than us or something. Um, and what was happening was they weren't counting like computer specialists in, in the engineering statistics. And the US actually, uh, the, the US had a substantial lead in terms of software. Um, engineers. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Um, and definitely more work to be done on that subject. Um, cool. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions depending on uh, how quick your answers are. So here's one from Alice. Uh, one issue not directly addressed is that there are unresolved ethical privacy and security issues that can prevent the acceptance and therefore growth slash diffusion of these technologies. Any thoughts on this? Uh, one could say that these issues were also unresolved for the PC, yet they didn't stop the PC from becoming a general purpose technology. Yeah, yeah. I, this is a really good question. Um, and yeah, I, I haven't looked into this as much as I want to because it is something that's really relevant today, which is, you know, like there's all this stuff I've been thinking about is like, there's all this stuff about China is outpacing the US in terms of adoption of facial recognition, right? And uh, actually we're seeing a lot of pushback to facial recognition in China because of some of these issues of privacy, uh, security. Um, and it, it could be that sort of, if you're looking in terms of the three, four decade timeframe cycle, um, you want to have a more sustainable approach to developing some of these technologies. Um, and it could be sort of like that, that sort of Miles' work on trustworthy AI and other people have talked about sort of privacy preserving machine learning. It could be like investments in those types of technologies are gonna be more conducive towards the sort of like long-term GPT diffusion that I'm talking about. I haven't explored these in the past, sort of one initial counter argument to that is, is exactly what Alice said, which is just that some of these unfortunately might be short-term concerns and sort of like 
the overriding pressure of GPT diffusion, the competitive need to adopt automation at scale on, on, on sort of like national economic competition level might force aside those um, ethics and security concerns in the long run. Awesome. Uh, so we're uh, just at time and, and want to thank you again, Jeff, for uh, being so generous with your time and insights here. And uh, I definitely learned a lot. And I'm sure others did as well. And thanks uh, everyone in the audience for your attention and great question. Uh, so that's unfortunately all the time we have. Uh, so uh, the topic of next week's seminar is decolonizing AI. And if you're interested in uh, attending that, you can register through the HAI website. Uh, and we hope to virtually see you all there. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Miles.